Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of SETI Live. I am your host, Beth Johnson, the uh, social media coordinator here at the SETI Institute. Joining me today is Dr. Wael Farah, who is a postdoctoral researcher here at the Institute, and he works at the Allen Telescope OA. And with us is one of his REU students, research experience for undergraduates, Madeline King, who is uh, currently an undergrad at Smith College. So thank you for joining us. We are here today to talk about using the Allen Telescope Array in the search for techno signatures and the uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So um, welcome, Wael, welcome, Madeline, and welcome to all our viewers. Please let us know where you are watching from. We're thrilled to have you here today. Yes. So Wael, what is this project? Uh, sure. Um, let, let me give a bit of a background. So the Allen Telescope Array is a um, is a radio interferometer, um, and an interferometer is a collection of small dishes that um, collectively um, um, can be utilized as a as a single dish, or we can um, we can sort of subdivide it into subarrays and then use it. Um, differently. And so um, an, an array or an interferometer is, is essentially is a collection of smaller dishes. Um, and the Allen Telescope Array has 42 elements. So um, the number of stations or the number of, um, of antennas um, that we have at the Allen Telescope Array is in total 42. Um, we currently have half of the array up and running and um, functioning um, properly. Um, and so um, every, every dish is a six meter um, dish. We have a large frequency coverage. In other words, we can, um, we, we are sensitive from, um, we are sensitive to electromagnetic radiation from one gigahertz all the way to 10 gigahertz. And um, we use that to do various type of sciences um, and in, in primarily um, performing SETI, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, um, but also doing other kinds of sciences like um, the study of um, neutron stars, um, pulsars, and the study of fast radio bursts. And so this is like the brief or the, you know, the general overview of the Allen Telescope Array. By the way, that's... Uh, so yeah, that's that's one of the dishes here, right? Oh my gosh, I can't do the mirrored images, but um, this is one of the this is one of the Allen Telescope Array dishes right behind me. Um, so yeah, um, um, I guess we can we can sort of discuss the particular project that um, Madeline um, has been undertaking, and I'll, you know I'll I'll move the move the discussion to to Madeline in a bit, but in 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 short. Um, the Allen Telescope Array has undergone a, um, a period of refurbishment um, for the last two years. And so we've been upgrading the, a lot of the systems. We've been upgrading the, the, the front end or the, the sensors of the, um, of the, you know, the feeds of the, of the instrument, whatever senses the electromagnetic um, radiation. So this has been upgraded. Um, we're also upgrading our digital signal processing system. Um, and so Madeline's project was the first project that we undertake um, or the first SETI project that we undertake with our upgraded system. Um, and that was using um, nine, of the, nine of the 20 antennas because we were still sort of building them up. Um, but this was, this was pretty much the, the you know, to, to the excitement, that was pretty much the first um, SETI experiment that has been done on the instrument um, with the upgraded, um, with our upgraded system. That's, um, that's yeah. really great that it's being upgraded. I'm excited to hear that. Yeah. Um, do you? Uh, I can give. I can give the description of the project, or you can do that, Madeline. You can, you know, bounce back and forth. I would. I would say. Um, well, let's yeah, let's you, have let's have Madeline do the description of the project. I'm really quickly before we get into that. I want to welcome all of these viewers. So many watching from all over. Uh, Maryland, Germany, Ireland, Australia, uh, the Netherlands, England, uh, Belgium, Minnesota, Ohio, Kentucky, France. New York, Pakistan, Florida, uh, Montreal, Colorado, Michigan, um, and Ontario. So, wow, um, that is a that is a global audience going there. Very cool. Thank you, everybody, for watching. As a reminder, we are a five hundred one c three nonprofit, and uh, we are supported in this program by viewers like all of you who give your bits, your stars, your super chats. All of those things go to keeping this program running, so we can continue to bring you SETI Live events um, every week and over the summer, uh, a lot of them. Uh, so, Madeline. 
you are working, you are here working on undergraduate research on the Allen Telescope Array. First off, that's awesome. Second off, what is your project exactly? Yeah, so I am looking at uh, data from a uh, survey of the Galactic Center performed at the Allen Telescope Array. Um, I'm looking for narrow band Doppler drifting radio signals. So um, what we're looking for is, is uh, signals in radio frequencies. We're looking between around 3.36 to 9.12 gigahertz. Um, we're looking for radio signals coming from the galactic center that are shifting in frequency as um, a potential extraterrestrial accelerator, extraterrestrial transmitter might be accelerating towards us. Um, so I can share my screen. Yes, please share your, show us the slides that you have for us today. So here we have um, an example of uh, how the Doppler effect works. So if you have um, some kind of transmitter, um, we're looking at transmitters, um, transmitting light, um, if a transmitter is uh, moving towards you or away from you, um, the frequency and the wavelength of the signal is going to be shifted um, at, when it is moving towards you or away from you. So, but um, if the signal is actually accelerating towards you or away from you, the frequency won't just be uh, shifted, but it will actually um, change over time. So we're looking for uh, radio signals that are um, changing in frequency over time. And this um, change is uh, called the signal's drift rate. So we think that these um, signals from a potential extraterrestrial civilization will be drifting in time because we expect some kind of acceleration either due to the Earth's uh, orbit or rotation, or um, for example, if a transmitter was located on an exoplanet, um, it should be accelerating towards or away from us due to uh, the orbit or rotation of the exoplanet. So. Um, this is just an example of what a uh, Doppler drifting narrowband radio signal looks like. Um, here on the right, we have the relative frequency of the signal um, on the x-axis um, and uh, time kind of going down on the y-axis. Uh, so you can see that um, that signal in, in yellow there um, is uh, changing in frequency um, as time passes. And then um, you can see the drift rate of the signal up on top. It's uh, negative 0 0.5 hertz per second. So that's the rate of change of um, the frequency. And then also up top there is the, uh, the date that the observation was taken. So you can see that the, um, the signal is changing um, over time. So I'm looking for these, uh, um, these signals in um, this survey taken by the Allen Telescope Array. Pretty much. Okay, uh, so why, why the Galactic Center for this search? Yeah, that's a great question, Beth. Um, the Galactic Center is a interesting place for many reasons. One of them is the, the density of stars um, and the density of planets nearby um, is super large um, when we look at the galactic at the galactic center or around the galactic center. Um, and so to increase our chances of detecting um, anything, we have to make sure we can um, probe as many planets as we can. And so the Galactic Center is is the pretty much the, a good a good place um, at least for 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 a starter. Um, also, we already know that the, the Galactic Center is a really active region, and so um, um, life the chance of life might decrease as we go towards you know shorter towards the Galactic Center. Um, but our survey was pretty much um, four degrees by four degrees, so we didn't really target the exact Galactic Center per se, but we also targeted the regions around it. Um, so yeah, so to optimize, essentially, the short answer to your question, to optimize our chances of detecting a, um, a techno signature. So Madeline, what has your work entailed so far on this project? What are you, what is the process that you're going through? Yeah, so a lot of what I've been doing is um, designing kind of a automated um, pipeline that will take the uh, observations that we have and run them through this uh, narrowband Doppler drifting signal search. And then um, a lot of what we've been working on as well is finding out how to filter out candidates from RFI or radio frequency interference. So uh, we find a lot of candidates, um, you know, in the in the millions, a lot of signals. Um, but most of them, maybe all of them, maybe some of them are, are extraterrestrial signals, but um, a lot of them are due to uh, interference from um, it could be anything, you know, satellites. If you have your cell phone turned on. Um, so any kind of any kind of human uh, interference. So um, I've been working a lot on 
figuring out how to filter out signals that are due to humans and not due to extraterrestrials. So while uh, that seems to be a, a pretty recurrent problem for the type of telescope that you guys are using at the Allen Telescope Array, what sort of policies do you have in place to, to minimize the effects of RFI? Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely. Um, radio frequency interference is pretty much uh, any radio astronomer's nightmare. Um, so sometimes I, you know, heard colleagues talking about um, RFI, you know, popping in, in in their dreams. Like that's that's kind of literally the the, the case. Um, so yeah, it's a big problem in in radio astronomy. Um, a few a few things we can try to mitigate RFI. Um, one of them is we need to make sure that on site. We have nothing um, that can transmit any um, any radio radiation. Um, so, in other words, we have to always keep our phones off, make sure you know we don't have any smartwatches on, no Bluetooth, no Wi-Fi. Um, I think Madeline had had a taste of all of that because she she spent some time here on site too, without you know the 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 privilege of having Wi-Fi and you know walking around with a cell phone. Um, so this is this is kind of a, a direct way that we can we can use on site to to try and mitigate and minimize the effect of um, 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 RFI. But this is this is really a, 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 a not a substantial thing we can do. Um, the the issue kind of comes from you know outside outside the site. So any you know towns nearby, any you know someone driving down down the road with their phones on. Um, any transmitters um, around the place. So this, all of this kind of gets into our data. Um, satellites, airplanes are an issue, electric fences, um, car engines, you know, you name it. Um, and so to, mit to mitigate those, we have to, one, um, make sure we, we see them and ident identify them. Um, we know that certain transmitters have certain um, characteristics and certain frequencies that emit at. So we can mitigate that effect by just flagging that data out. Um, we can also use interferometric um, um, procedures in order to re remove um, RFI. Um, so again, uh, the, the ATA is an interferometer. It's a collection, of, a collection of dishes, and we can use that to our advantage. Um, in other words, the response, of a, the response of an antenna on the sky is not a single source. It's kind of a... Um, Sort of a, it has it has a it has a shape it has a bell bell like shape, and the idea is we can point um, different antennas at different positions on the sky and try to search for signatures at the same time from uh, from those subarrays. And the idea is if we can detect the same signal in all of the in all of the subarrays that are that are pointed really far away on on the sky that are pointed far away from the sky. If I can if we get it, if we can detect the same signal in all of the subarrays. This is a really high chance that um, the signal is not astrophysical because it, it can't be coming from a particular position in the sky if we pick it up in multiple um, in multiple beams, what we call beams. Um, and so part of part of Madeline's project, um, maybe Madeline can show um, some some um, plots of that, is to try and search um, um, try to search antennas that are pointed away from each other um, or that are not pointed at the same target on the sky at the same time. And see if we can detect the same signal from all of them. Um, and if we can detect the same signal, then this is definitely RFI. If not, then this is this is something more exciting or more interesting that is worth us looking at. Okay, so before we before Madeline gets into that, I want to take a quick break, one second here, and I want to welcome some more viewers uh, from Louisiana, Mississippi, Poland, Sweden, and Idaho. And also, I would like to give shout outs. Uh, so thank you to Thomas on YouTube. Thank you to Sabine on Facebook. And uh, thank you to Paula for your donations today. Uh, much appreciated. So Madeline, um, you have some more slides you can show us that get into what you've been working on. So let's go ahead and, and take that away. Yeah. So here is kind of an image of exactly what Weil was just talking about, um, using the different subarrays to kind of cross match and um, see if we're picking up the same signal in uh, different places across the sky. So we have um, three subarrays used in the uh, survey with three dishes each, and they each look at a different place on the sky simultaneously. So what we do is we look to see if we see the same signal um, picked up in multiple subarrays. And if we do pick it up in multiple subarrays, then it's probably sitting right next to us um, on the earth. Um, but if it only shows up in one subarray, then there's a pretty good chance um, 
that it warrants some further um, investigation. So here's one example of a candidate we detected um, around uh, 7,000 megahertz. This candidate has a drift rate of uh, 0.1 hertz per second. But as you can see um, in each of these rectangles um, are represent each of the subarrays that we're using. So the candidate shows up in each of the subarrays. So it's probably RFI because if it, uh, if it was um, an authentic signal, it should only show up in one subarray. Um, and then here's an example of a signal that only shows up in one subarray. So this would warrant some, some more investigation. So the drift rate of the signal is pretty small. It's only 0.2 Hertz per second. So probably also RFI, but um, the fact that it only shows up in one of the subarrays. So one of the pointings um, makes it a little bit more interesting. So just to clarify the, the signal that we're looking at is the yellow mark at the, on the very top one. Yeah, exactly. So the, the yellow line is um, is the candidate, and then that red dotted line is um, just for uh, visual interest, showing the um, the drift rate that our um, our search pipeline picked up. Yeah. Okay. So how this is going to be a kind of a hard question? How many candidate signals do you think you have gone through so far? Yeah. So. Um, in our initial kind of run of looking for signals, we had um, more than 2 million, um, but after, yes, <laughs> big number. <laughs> so definitely way too many to look at one by one. Um, so after we um, kind of ran it through that, that filtering pipeline to see if it showed up in multiple different subarrays, we had um, around 114,000, which is still a big number, but you know, definitely down from 2 million, which we're excited about. Um, and then we still have lots of hits that are still showing up um, with pretty low drift rates. So we can um, probably filter those out. And then we're left with maybe 4,000 that are a little bit more interesting and then warrant some, some further visual um, excuse me, inspection, which I'm actually doing right now. So what, what kind of drift rates are you looking for? What, what are the, 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 what's the numbers that you're looking for here? Yeah. So, um, we are looking between um, around a little bit more than zero to about 10 hertz per second drift rates. Uh, the thing about drift rates is that um, the more drift rates you look for, the higher the, the number of um, the maximum drift rate, the more uh, computationally expensive it becomes. So um, if you want to look up to, you know, say like 200 hertz per second um, drift rates, it just takes more and more and more time for the computer to um, to find those signals. So we look up to um, 10 Hertz per second and 10 Hertz per second is what we would expect for um, a transmitter that um, kind of comparable to any uh, object in our solar system. So that it's kind of a, a realistic drift rate, but if you wanted to search for um, signals showing up on maybe like really like interesting exoplanets, like something like an exoplanet that was like really dense and um, was or, uh, rotating really quickly, then we, we might not be able to pick that up. So it's just kind of a, a, um, a give and take between um, computation time and looking for more and more signals at a higher drift rate. Exactly. And we, we, also, go down, we also go down to negative 10. So mm -hmm. it's between, between 0 and 10 and 0, or a bit more than 0 and 10, and a bit less than 0 and minus 10. OK. Uh, so this one, this one's an audience question, but I was going to ask it anyway. So I want to acknowledge that it was asked by the audience as well. Uh, what is the filtering program that you're using? Is this this a machine learning algorithm of some sort? Um, that's a that's the custom that's a it's a custom written um, pipeline that we put together. Um, I guess Madeline did a great, an awesome job, um, you know, building building that. Um, but yeah, the short answer to your question, it is um, something that we built and it's not a, it's not machine learning, at least as of yet. Yeah, but we're okay. also using a lot of tools. Um, some of the, like the original tools that are used to detect the narrow band Doppler drifting signals um, were designed by um, like the Breakthrough Listen project, which searches, which does perform SETI surveys. Um, so we're using a tool called Turbo SETI, um, which is the kind of the initial detector of the, um, the signals. So what's next on this project for you, Madeline? Yeah, so uh, now that we have 
found all of our candidates, it's kind of finally time to be looking at all of them and perform some visual inspection um, to see if we actually, you know, detected a signal from an extraterrestrial civilization. Um, uh, in addition to actually looking at the signals to see if we found anything interesting, we can also figure out what kind of RFI are making its way through our filtering process so we can kind of design more ways to uh, filter the kind of RFI that we see. And while what's overall, what's, how is, does this fit into the overall project? Yeah. Um, so again, so this is, this is our first sort of run, our first SETI um, experiment that we've done on our instrument. And this, this will um, pretty much set the scene for what's going to happen um, next. And um, we are hoping that um, with, with more compute um, power, we can actually get to a point where um, we can detect the signal or we can you know, search for signals and detect them as the telescope is recording data. And I'll come back to this, why this is important. Um, as, as we're recording data and be able to do the, you know, the RFI mitigation and do the, the searching and do the you know, scrutiny, maybe using machine learning, who knows, um, something that is you know, more and more automated. Um, and we can do this as, as we are recording data so that we can capture as much information as we can from our instrument, from our telescope um, to, to perform more and more um, um, rigorous um, analysis. Um, so I, again, I always go back to the fact that um, the, the ATA is an interferometer. And the nice thing about an inter interferometer is it can allow us to create easily create maps of the sky. And so if you imagine if we detected something interesting, um, we can not only say we have detected something, um, we can also say we have detected something that is coming from this particular location in the sky. So we can localize the signal to a particular location in the sky um, to um, you know, want to add to our um, sort of analysis and to, to, um, um, to, to make sure that this candidate is not RFI. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to take one more quick break here and welcome some viewers from Nevada, Utah, and Virginia, and a shout out to, and Portugal, and a shout out to Philip on YouTube. Thank you for your donation as well. Uh, so Madeline, what has been, what is this, what's been the most interesting thing you've l done research-wise on this project for you this summer? Uh, uh, that's a hard question. It's it's all been so cool. Really, um, I was so excited to find out really at the beginning of the summer that I would actually be able to be on site at the ATA. So it was just so cool, like after a year of um, you know, taking classes online and not being in person at all, just to be on site at the ATA and um, spend time in person with Weil and all the other folks up there and um, be able to, you know, actually look out the window and see the um, the dishes moving. So that was really, really cool um, to be able to be up there and uh, just exploring all the different um, techniques for um, RFI mitigation and looking for uh, narrowband signals. It um, It's really cool to um, interact with the community of people that are kind of building these tools. Um, so that's been really cool as someone who's interested in both computer science and astronomy, looking at um, how software is developed in like a community setting for uh, astronomy has been really interesting. So I know the summer's kind of winding down and you're, you're getting ready to do your final presentations. Uh, are you planning on continuing on with this work once you go back to school? Yeah, I definitely would like to continue on with file. Um, yeah, it's been so cool. And I, I definitely want to um, see it all the way through and, and make sure we check out all the candidates and see if we found anything interesting. And from a, from a personal standpoint, what has been the most exciting part about this summer? Well, this has actually been um, kind of my first research experience with, um, in general, with astronomy. And uh, so it was so cool to be able to um, be hands on with research and kind of apply everything I've learned in class for the last uh, two years in college. Um, so it was really exciting to, to get such a cool uh, first research opportunity. That's fantastic. It is really exciting. Um, as as some people know, I was in the 2013 cohort and it was just, it's an amazing summer, isn't it? It's just, you'll look back and trust me, I still look back on it and say that it was an amazing summer. 
Um, I'm going to take some questions from the audience now. We've had some coming in. So if there are more questions, please submit them and uh, the moderators will pass them on to me. Uh, first up, uh, YL, how old are some of these signals? How far are these having to travel that we're looking at? Um, we are looking at candidates that, or well, potential candidates that might be coming from halfway through the galaxy. So we're talking about, um, you know, tens and tens of thousands of um, light years away. That seems, I, I don't know, that just seems to me as if even if you found something, what, what would that actually determine for us? What would make you say, what would make you go, yes, this is a thing. This is a thing that I can have other people look at. Yeah, um, so this question comes up a lot and I'm glad I'm really glad that um, people wonder about this. Um, you know, this is this is not this is this is science, and um, science means that we have to be able to repeat our experiment, right? Um, so one part of, one part of Madeline, Madeline's project was to you know search the data, look at the data, and see if there's something interesting. If there is something interesting, we can use our telescope again and go back on sky and search again and see if we can find it again. And so repeatability in science is really essential. Um, and so, you know, we can, we can go, there's a lot of details here that is involved into, you know, there's many steps that we have to go through. Um, but in, in, in short, we have to be able, one, to, um, um, to mitigate or to, to, um, to discard any sources of interference as a um, explanation of our um, data. To make make sure that we can repeat this experiment, so go back and uh, so go back on the sky and repeat it. And three, um, try to repeat this experiment with a different telescope. Um, and if other instruments were able to find the same findings, then this is this is what you know can uh, make us jump in our seats and you know um, celebrate. But this is this is how this is how science works. Uh, another question from the audience: um, You talked about why we're scanning the galactic center, why that's the focus of this particular research project. Would you consider scanning, say, the outer arms of the Milky Way instead? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, there's, you know, there's no, there's no sort of hard limit as to where we need to search. Um, the, a, good, a good way to, to go is rather than just doing the galactic um, center is go along the galactic plane and um, um, yeah, I mean, this this was the this was sort of a I call it a pilot survey, so um, sort of the you know the very first step. But then, yes, um, doing an old sky survey, for example, would be would be awesome. So rather than just focusing on the galactic centers, just doing all the sky as much as right. we can, um, yeah, as fa as fast as we can. Do you think that we'll get to the point where an all sky survey is a possibility? Um, yeah, we, we are already in a in a position where we can uh, we can start doing that. Um, our beam size, so the shape, the the, the response of the um, of the of the of the dish on the sky is relatively large, um, especially with you know with, with the ATA is relatively large, and so we can we can pretty much scan um, a lot of um, area um, quite quickly. Um, it's just putting everything together in terms of um, you know all the software that's needed to 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 do the work, um, the you know all the analysis and the um, candidate scrutiny. All of this needs to be in place, and all of this needs to be rigorously tested, um, so that we one we do not miss on things, and two we do not overwhelm ourselves with candidates. Um, but yes, we are we are sort of step by step getting to that getting to that point. So one last question uh, from the audience. I'm, I'm going to modify it just a little bit, but um, Madeline, from your perspective, and I'll ask this of YL as well, what do you think the timeline is for finding a techno signature? Uh, that, I mean, it could be, it could be sitting on our computer right now, or it could be, um, you know, years and years from now. So there are um, lots of study surveys that have been um, conducted, you know, since the 60s and 70s and still going on today at the ATA and at um, radio telescopes, you know, all over the world. So really, um, it could be any time or it could be, you know, decades from now. Um, 
just depending on if we get lucky and um, as the uh, sensitivity of our instruments increase and more and more people are kind of um, looking, uh, performing SETI surveys and, you know, if um, interest in SETI um, and in uh, looking for these techno signatures kind of increases and more and more surveys are being conducted. So anytime. And YL, how about you? What's your, what do you think? Um, I would, I would pretty much agree with what Madeline said. Um, but I also add that we are getting more and more, we are getting better and better at doing it. Um, so experiments back in the 60s um, and the 70s were confined to smaller bandwidth. And so the, the search bandwidth were a few kilohertz up to you know, a few megahertz. Um, nowadays, we can do a few gigahertz. And so um, our, um, our search sp space, our search um, phase, if you want, is, is pretty much accelerating and expanding. And so we're getting better and better at doing these searches. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, it, who knows? It, it, could be, it could be a few years, it could be a few days, it could be a few months. Um, but what we, what we know is that we are getting better at, at doing this, but there's still a lot to search, um, search in. Thank you. Um, this has been really fantastic and I've enjoyed having both of you on. Uh, one more quick shout out. Thank you to Griffin on YouTube for the donation. And also again, thank you so much to our viewers on Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube. You make this happen. You, you are why we do this and we really appreciate having you all here. I would also like to thank YL and Madeline for sharing their research with us and good luck to all of you in your research. Good luck to you, Madeline, in your undergrad. Um, I, I, I hope this is kind of like lit that spark and you'll stay in the field with us because we need more people looking for techno signatures. So that's awesome. Um, thank you again, everybody. Uh, I want to remind all of you that uh, our next study live is tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific. So that is minus seven UTC for people who need to translate that. Uh, we will have CEO Bill Diamond on with our Frontier Development Lab partners. So they're going to do kind of an overview of the program and how it's gone this summer. And also next week, we have our next SETI Talks event, which is about can we define life and should we? That is on Wednesday, August 18th at 7 p.m. There are still uh, spots available on our Zoom registration. Eventbrite and look us up. Uh, if you are interested in participating more, if you want to become a SETI star, which is a monthly donor to our organization, please go to SETI.org and take a look and join us over there. We would love to have you. We have a newsletter you can subscribe to. You will get all of our current information as we send it out. And once again, thank you so much for supporting SETI Live. Thank you so much for support, supporting the SETI Institute. And we will be back tomorrow. So um, thank you, everyone. And YL and Madeline, if you can just stay on when we go off air, that would be great. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.